So good morning, everyone. Um, as Carolyn said, yeah, I have some engineering uh, experience and also as a transport manager. Um, and one of my uh, regular jobs is to assess um, technicians to be ERTEC qualified. Um, and along the way with that, I try and get them to demonstrate that they can do a rolling road brake test. Although it's not part of the ERTEC qualification, what it does do is give some interesting findings, or you could say excuses. So, over the last few years, I've made it my business to try and understand roller road brake testing. And as Carolyn said, we did a little bit of a, a presentation a while back. So, um, we're going to share some of that information with you today. Hopefully, it's not too technical. Um, if it is, I do apologise, but it is what it is. So, we're going to have a look at the background as to why this is so important. What options we have to do brake testing and making sure we prep right in the first place, then understanding our brake test report, but also thinking about the other components on a vehicle or trailer, and then looking at how we manage this, which if we reflect on what Catherine and Caroline have already said this morning, this is the important part. As transport managers, you're not technicians necessarily, but you do need to take control and manage your brake testing. Okay. So ever since the Bath Tipper tragedy, traffic commissioners, DVSA, have focused on testing with the support of the industry. And for that reason, um, half of failed brake tests have now gone, but there is still improvement to do. And we must remember, as the Guide to Maintaining Roadworthiness uh, recommends, that we must assess the brake performance on every safety inspection. It recommends that we do rolling road brake tests four times a year, but that's the minimum. Why would you want to work to a minimum standard? Brilliant. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Um, of course, if you're 12 weekly, then that's going to work out like that, but most people, well, it's always a six weekly anyway, so, you know, we should be there. Um, loaded as well. So, as of January next year, DVSA are going to be requiring you to get your vehicle loaded for an MOT anyway, for a rolling road brake test. Um, if we don't load the vehicle, what you're doing on a rolling road brake test really is putting your car on there with the air brake system of a truck because the weight difference to the system is completely different. Okay, So we're not really getting a true effect of what we should be having. Okay, And sadly, of course, brake efficiency is often the demise of maintenance investigations coming up unsatisfactory and of course leads to regulatory action against the operator. So, what options do we have? Rolling road brake test, good to hear that most operators now are opting for this. The, be the benefit, of course, of a rolling road brake test is that it looks at the service brake, where applicable secondary braking and parking braking. It doesn't just give an overall performance, it analyzes each wheel or hub, whichever way you want to call it, um, and then gives you a written report at the end of it. The cellometers are okay, but they're only really suitable for rigid vehicles. They will not measure the brake efficiency of anything drawing a trailer or the trailer, so they just give a G-force reading. Your Tapley meter is the other word for that if you're not familiar with the technical name. Um, but you do get a printout and it gives an overall reading, but that's all you get. EBPMS, Electronic Brake Performance Monitoring System. Um, been out a few years now um, and is very good, certainly ideal for trailers, but before you uh, invest any money in that, I strongly recommend that you look to see what the system offers. It must meet the statutory requirements for brake testing. It must be able to give you information on each wheel and hub, okay, and highlight any defects that are likely to come up. So, good system all round, but make sure you get the right one if you're going to invest in it, because these are not cheap, um, but they are very good. And it's also, it's on the spot information all the time, not just a safety inspection. Brake temperature measurement can improve efficiency and effectiveness of testing. It's good when it's used with a road test. Okay? There are several options you can use for that, for testing, whether it be a remote system or an individual monitoring device. Um, but road tests on their own are simply not adequate. You're doing no more than your driver does, really, going down the road and putting his brakes on. Okay? And chances are you probably won't have a load on when it comes out of the garage halfway through a PMI. All right, so not good enough on their own. We need to be 
much, much better than that in this day and age. We move on somewhere. Oh, we're stuck. <laughs> we might have to improvise here. Yeah, we'll get on to the technical bit now. Okay. Um, right, do you want to see if we can move my slide on and I'll carry on talking? <laughs> so, <laughs> the next thing is um, we're going to assume we're all going to do rolling road brake tests going forward. Um, the vehicle must be loaded to 65% of the weight. The reason for this is that it opens up the load sensing valve fully and allows for full brake actuation in the chamber. Okay, So you're getting the full strength of your braking system. And that's the importance of it. Also, of course, it allows for a better grip on the rolling road test itself. Okay, So much many benefits in that. And as I said, DVSA will be enforcing this um, at MOT. Your tyres can make a big difference to the outcome of your test. Where tyres are at different pressures, different tread depths to their opposing wheels, could cause an imbalance on your rolling road brake test report. Okay? An underinflated tyre will sit heavy, whereas an overinflated will bounce. So there's less tread on the rollers. But if you present a vehicle that is obviously underinflated on the tyres, it will be refused the test anyway, and rightly so. The person applying the brakes should have some experience here. I've watched this, and an engineer demonstrated this for me. It's all about the rhythm here, and it is quite important because if they put the brakes on wrong, you'll get a completely different reading. Now, if they're on an off day, on the left-hand side will be great, the right-hand side will be awful, okay? So make sure that the person operating the brakes on the truck, the foot brake, to do the service brake, has got a good rhythm and knows what he's doing. It's very, very important, that, otherwise we don't get a true reading. Positioning the vehicle, on my tours around the workshops throughout the country, throughout the UK, we've had rolling road brake tests situated over there in the corner. So oh, it's ever such a hard job to get that trailer on there straight. Uh, or it's built on an angle. So we'll get an imbalance. So what was the point of doing a rolling road brake test then? Because it's going to tell a load of lies, isn't it? Okay. So make sure that A, you can get your rolling road brake test in a position where it's accessible preferably dug into the ground rather than sitting on top. But that's not always a given. It depends what's purchased. The conditions are good. So the rollers are, are dry. The tyres are dry. Okay, The rolling road brake test itself is calibrated regularly. The rollers have good grip on them. And uh, in general, we should get a good report. The software is also important as well. All these rolling road brake testers have DVSA software. And that must be kept up to date to allow for most modern vehicles and any changes that are made in tolerances and parameters. Okay. So, we've all seen a rolling road brake test. We all understand them because it says pass at the bottom, so that's all right, isn't it? <laughs> we need to understand a bit more than that. So before we make sense of the report, let's go through a few things. The bind. Bind is a reading when the brakes are not actually applied. And it's set against the service brake only, the foot brake. If the bind is more than 4% of the measured axle weight, this will show as a failure in the unsatisfactory wheel performance section of your report. So all this is based on weight a lot of the time, these percentage figures. Just bear that one in mind. It will save me explaining it too much. Time lag is where the assessor asks for the brakes to be applied and nothing <coughs> happens. So this is a manual assessment only. It's not part of the rolling road brake test. If he deems or she deems that there's a delay between, is your foot brake on, sir? Yeah, and nothing's happening. That's our time lag. And that will be, of course, written on the report at the end, okay? Not part of the rolling road. Ovility. Basically, we've got a warped drum or a wonky disc, okay? Where there's 70% difference in brake force efforts as the wheel rotates, this will show up as ovility. And it's not going to give us a smooth brake braking once we're out on the road with a load on. The vehicle will fail, so if there's more than 70% difference between the highest and the lowest brake reading effort. Okay. Then we have imbalance. This is one of my favourites because I've seen it ignored so many times. And as a driver in the past, I do not want to drive a truck that steers me into the ditch or the centre reservation when I touch the brakes. Okay. So what is imbalance? A measure is measured across an axle and shows the difference between the braking effort on one side to the other is shown as a percentage. The vehicle will fail if the brake imbalance is more than 30%. Okay? But that's the fail point. Okay? Why go to the fail point? Right. 
things. We should have our own tolerances for imbalance. Okay, and I'll talk about standards in a minute. Having said this, it doesn't apply when both wheels lock or when one wheel locks and the braking effort of the locked wheel is less than that of the other. Often this can happen on semi-trailers and is more acceptable for this reason. Semi-trailers have their own characteristics. You cannot fail due to excessive parking brake imbalance, but that will show. And it is recommended from the Guide to Maintaining Roadworthiness, over 25% imbalance you should investigate I'd certainly look at my braking system at that uh, percentage and have another brake test. Okay? Maximum brake effort. Your vehicle will fail if there is no brake effort recorded or the maximum force is less than 5% of the measured axle weight. Okay? So what we're saying is we've touched the brakes and there's not really a lot of there, but they can still stop. The axle weight will be shown on the report and this is quite important because this is why we're saying that for MOT, for brake testing in general, we should have that 65% of axle weight to allow things to work properly and show that we can actually stop a 44 ton truck, not a heavy car on an air brake system. Okay, and that's really the objective. So you should aim high for each axle weight to at least 65% to enable the load sensing valve to open. Um, insufficient load message will be included in a test summary, okay, but it doesn't account for front axles on vehicles. Because I'll explain the next bit. FWA, have we all seen that on brake test? Do we know what it means? Well, it's a bit of a law, law of physics, really. Um, when the front wheels lock up and the load imposed is too little, this factor considers the weight transfer from the rear to the front of the vehicle. So we all know we take a dip if we stop in a hurry. And that's exactly what that's doing. It's bringing a weight force with it. And that consideration is taken from the DVSA's software database and the tolerances and parameters will then be shown on your brake test. Okay? So it's to overcome the laws of physics and an actual reaction, if you like. Lastly, KGF, kilogram force. The amount of brake force achieved measured in kilograms and must be more than that 5%. The higher, the better here. It shows that the brakes have had to work and they can actually stop a bit of weight. Okay? When we're down on low figures, that's not so good. So in summary... Find on the service brake only, no more than 4% measured axle weight. Time lag is done as a manual assessment. Ovility can't be any more than 70% between brake reading higher and lower. And the imbalance taken from the service brake and any designated secondary braking shouldn't be any more than 30%. And maximum force, of course, must be more than 5% of the axle weight. Okay, so these are the key areas that we're looking for. The HGV inspection manual, which of course you should all be familiar with, sets the test standards. Okay, for motor vehicles and tra for motor vehicles is 50%, and for trailers 45%, other than drawbar combinations from January 2012. Where secondary brakes are fitted is 25% of the design gross train weight, uh, sorry, vehicle weight, and for parking brakes, any vehicle should meet 16% or more of the design gross train weight, and any other additional braking systems would need to hit 70%. So, semi-trailers, as I said, come into a bit of their own. They have a minimum total brake force for semi-trailers, and this is based on how many wheels lock. So, if five of your wheels lock, we're looking for an overall brake force of 3,600 kilogram force. Okay? Four wheels lock, then it's a little bit more. And three or less, we would go back to the normal laden trailer weight requirements. For the park brake, all wheels on which the parking brake operates should lock at 1,500 kilogram force. And any wheel in which the parking brake operates does not lock would need to go to 4,200 kilogram force. So it needs to show it's still working. Okay. Let's take a look. Let's take a look at service brake performance. Locked wheels. We all hear, we hear this all the time. Well, the wheels locked up, so that was all right. I mean, it did stop, you're right, but it was that old car air brake system again, isn't it, really? It doesn't really show us too much. Locked wheels occur when very little braking effort is applied, and this is caused by insufficient weight over the axles, and of course recorded against the service brake. Loading the vehicle will apply more weight and traction to the rollers, and this in turn will increase your braking effort and give for a better brake report, and know that your vehicle will stop, safe, stop safely when it's loaded. You could say then the lock-up is truck air brakes on a car. 
The load sensing valve will restrict the amount of brake actuation. Therefore, it is vital that 65% of the weight is achieved. This then opens the load sensing valve fully and allows a full complement of air into the brake chamber passed onto the braking discs. That way we know the brakes are working fully. Okay. The highest reading uh, should be recorded. When you look at your brake test, if ever you've watched one, the needle will sit there going like that, something like that. It will record the highest reading, so it gives you the best opportunity. Okay, so that's always there, but it will also show the imbalance at that point as well. Okay. So we'll take a look at a report. So this is just a header part of a report, which we get on many things. Um, you will have the license plate number, the Department for Transport plate number, the vehicle itself, its gross vehicle weight and train weight, time and location and date of the test, of course, which is very important for your maintenance records. So that's basically all header information, but as always, as with all maintenance records, check it, read it, and make sure it's correct. Okay. Then we go on to the nitty-gritty part of the re report, if you like. This is what the axles are actually doing. So my first concern is to look at the weight on the axle. Now, this report was taken from a 19-tonne gross vehicle weight to axle rigid vehicle. Three tonne on the front, about half the weight it could be, okay? Axle two, even less. And it actually shows us, look, insufficient load on axle two. It's nowhere near where it should be, okay? So let's take a look, service brake, near side and off side, I've passed the bind, passed the time lag test and the ovility. Then we get the brake force and any imbalance, which is great on this axle, 4%, which we can live with that, it's very, very little. Okay? And likewise, on the second axle, uh, everything has passed, okay? we've got 5% imbalance. Then on the handbrake, on the parking brake, again, it's just not quite met the full uh, complement there required because it should be around 1600 but it will probably show as a pass because the next thing to look at of course down the right hand side is that everything is locked okay so if we go on to the next slide we should get the test summary so this is the summary part which everyone looks at and of course the bit we're interested in is this bit here because it says pass jobs are good and isn't it but don't these read a story okay um Richard shaking his head. <laughs> First of all, I'll point out 50% pass value against 56% test value. That's a 6% tolerance. Is your rolling road as good as the one down the road where the MOT is going to be? That's not a great deal of difference, is it? 6%. Okay. And that's likewise on secondary and parking brake. Parking brake there, 18%, um, very, very minimal. But we do have forward weight allowance on there and this is where sometimes the misconception is because we've allowed that to happen and not had enough weight on the back axle in the first place to give a true reading okay so albeit as passed we've still got some minimal margins there to look at okay then we can go back to report and analyze it a bit more so if we move on I'll come back to a couple of reports in a minute. But before we put the lorry on the rolling road brake test, it's normally gone in for an inspection, hasn't it? So would it be favourable to make sure the vehicle is inspected and repaired before we put it on the rolling road brake test? Okay. There are many things we need to look at here. So being familiar with the HGV inspection manual. The warning system is normally audible, but it must be visible as well. The time to reach minimum brake pressure is three minutes on a rigid vehicle, six minutes on a trailer combination. And when it meets minimum brake pressure, we should have two full brake applications without the warning system coming back on. Then all brake components underneath, which we don't normally see, should be checked to make sure nothing is missing. They function, they're secure, not damaged. Hoses do not need repair or they're starting to fray. So everything is in good condition. Air valves are not corroded. Nothing is leaking. The load sensing valve is working and the linkage to that can work freely. Brake chambers are not corroded and there's no sign of any wear in the diaphragms. Then we have S-cams, bushes, etc., which lead into the brake hub are all items that wear. So we need to check that everything's good there. 
automatic slack adjusters should be working properly and be well lubricated. Before a brake test is completed then, it is vital that the safety inspection has took in all brake components and made any rectifications to possible defects. That gives the truck a fair chance then, doesn't it? Okay, so we move on. So we make sure we take remedial action. The brakes are inspected, we've adjusted them if we do need to, new parts are fitted, all rectifications, of course, recorded on your inspection sheet, filed for 15 months. Then the next thing we do is a brake test. If we haven't done one already, okay, we do the first one or the second one, depending on whether we've done the repair in what sequence. Then re analyse your report. If you're satisfied with that, it's at that point it goes on your maintenance records. Okay. So be familiar with the HGV inspection manual. There are seven different areas there, from service brake operation to additional parking brake systems and then the service brake performance, which I've explained to you this morning. As every good TM would do, we'll read through and make sure that they are familiar with those items. These books are freely available and they all update regularly. Okay. So we now understand the brake testing and how important it is. And with the words from Catherine and Caroline this morning, the emphasis, of course, is road safety. We've talked about the driver's mate. Well, rest assured, the technician's mate is just as damaging. Okay, because my boss said he's been in this industry 20, 30, 40 years on the spanners and he says that goes. That's all right then, isn't it? Okay, or is it? You're the operator. You're the one who stands in front of the traffic commissioner. Take control of your maintenance providers because there are so many people out there that don't. And this is something that fails you in the end. I think the last statistics, Caroline, 77% of unsatisfactory maintenance audits. That's shocking, isn't it? And half the time is, is because we go back to the chief engineer. Yeah, well, mate, you didn't need to do worry about that. We do the right thing here do they? Okay, take control. How often will your rolling road brake test be? The vehicle should be inspected and repaired first. Tyres are replaced and if required, pressures are adjusted. I looked at the inspection sheet the other day and the garage couldn't even be bothered to adjust the air pressure. Vehicle trailer is loaded to 65% and the technicians are ERTEC qualified. Okay, the ERTEC qualification is very good. It sets standards and make sure corners are not cut. And also the workshop should be accredited as well. Set your own limits for imbalance and test value. And of course, brake effort. The more brake effort, the better the brakes. Follow up your repairs and make sure you retest the vehicle or trailer before it goes back on the road and you're satisfied with what you've got. So they've all passed then. That's great because it says that at the bottom. So what I've got is a couple of... Uh, brake test that I've took from various brake testing uh, exercises and I just explained the story on them. So if we can just do full camera. Okay, so passed or not, as the case may be, that should go again hopefully. Okay, so I don't know how well you can see this one, but everything all looks great up there, okay. Um, overall it's passed, but down here the actual test value is less than that of the pass value on the handbrake and secondary braking as well. And the reason is because of the forward weight allowance, okay? So to the average eye, they'd look at that and go, well, that's all right, then it's passed. But when you look, you're actually 10% below the test value. It's time to get it back in and see what we can do to improve it. What's the main reason? Insufficient load on axle two. Imbalance is great, so we're happy with that. Okay, so if we move on to the next one. Should have a semi axle. Yep. yep. So this one's a semi. Well, they got we've gone too far. Okay. We've jumped the rollers. So this one's a semi trailer. Oh, it was a semi trailer. Okay. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so bear in mind, semi trailer axle weight of eight ton. We've got just shy of six ton on those, and just over on one. Um, so if you notice now, the maximum force figures around about two and a half thousand, two thousand which is much better because we've got more weight there. However, we've got quite an imbalance of 38%. As a driver, you're probably not going to notice that too much on a semi-trailer, but what it's telling me is that one side of those brakes is working a damn sight harder than the other, and that's not acceptable. Likewise, as we skim through the report, 
The imbalance is the thing here that I'm concerned with. Great, it's met, met its service break, 62% and 24%, but I still need to get that truck back in the workshop and even those brakes up. Okay. And lastly, this one, again, everything looks great, the wheels have locked, passed, but it's failed on parking brake, and it's also failed on ovility on the offside axle. So it's time to bring it back in, new drum or disc accordingly. Okay. So a few questions. The brake force difference between the two angles, what have we got? Here, I'll stand back and then I can read it. So over to you guys to answer these questions, please. I can because you flip the answers on the questions. <laughs> <laughs> so the term imbalance <laughs> found on a rolling road brake test report means the brake force difference between each hub on the same axle, or is it the brake force difference between the service brake and handbrake, or the brake force difference of the lowest and highest reading recorded? Okay, yeah, we'll go with that. Okay, so it's the brake force between each hub on the same axle, okay, is the right answer. The minimum brake test pass value for a goods vehicle service brake performance is? Got 78% are good. Okay, excellent. 50% is the right answer. And finally, during a rolling road brake test, bind is checked on the following. Hopefully, yep, we've all, all good, 91%, yep, service break only. Absolutely right, okay. And lastly, of course, make sure you get this information. Heavy goods vehicle inspection manual, guide to maintaining roadworthiness, category of defects, and logging on to dvsa.gov.uk for information on uh, electronic brake performance monitoring systems, best practice, and slack adjuster maintenance. You don't have to be a technician to understand this but take time to read the evidence and the documents that are there and that are available to you. It will only make for a better transport manager, better operation and safer roads. And that's the key objective, isn't it? Thank you very much.